a journey to where nature is at her most magnificent and forbidding. To mysterious places where dazzling and diverse cultures flourish. Where China's numerous ethnic groups draw you into a world of color and vibrancy. Where distinct lifestyles, traditions and crafts have survived the test of time. Join Travelogue on its 17-part Ethnic Odyssey, visiting more than 100 places across China. Ethnic Odyssey, an enlightened look at China's rich ethnic heritage. On this episode of Travelogue, we party with the Uyghur minority in search of the best sites in Turpan and Korolur. Variety of China's landscape, diversity of its people. Welcome to Travelogue's Minority Series. You're traveling through Turpan with me, Michelle Lean, and we begin our journey in a Uyghur home. People known for their excellent work ethics, warmth, and hospitality. Now sit back and relax while we discover the lives of the Uyghur community. Turpan is located in the southeast of the provincial capital, Urumqi. To get to Turpan, the hottest location in China, we cross the Tian Shan Mountains. Blistering hot in the summer and yet painfully cold in the winter, Turpan is an unconventional place for you to work on your tan. But hey, every once in a while, it's nice to stray from the typical beach holiday and journey to a cultural paradise. Turpan was once an important stop on the Silk Road, and today, the cultural influences from the past are still evident. In the Uyghur language, Turpan means place with rich soil. And it is that soil that gives Turpan the reputation of being the great garden of China. While the population is made up mostly of the Uyghur minority group, you really get a sense of how culturally integrated Uyghur and Han are when you're here. There's one place in Turpan particularly famous for its grapes, Putaoko. Great Valley is our first stop and it's known for its grapes as well as its raisins. Beneath the grapevines that frame their homes, the Uyghur people welcome you with fruit, naan, tea, and other local delicacies. They are extremely house proud and put in an enormous amount of effort into decorating their homes. Putagao is now a well-known tourist destination, and local Uyghurs have opened family-run restaurants. You can always try a homestay, but if you're just up for a meal and friendly conversation, adjourn to a local family-owned restaurant for a taste of Uyghur hospitality. <laughs> The Uyghur people know how to show you a good time, and they don't just stop at the food. I'm hanging out with my new friends, and they're trying to make me look like a Uyghur girl. They're going to teach me how to dance after this. Are we okay? Hola. Ah, okay. That's right, chances are they'll make you dance too. The most popular dance in Uyghur culture is the mashala, and whenever they're given the opportunity, they will perform. 
In general, I found the Uyghur people to be extremely outgoing and they will dance, sing, and play whenever the mood takes them. My new Uyghur friends were such captivating musicians and performers, I had to join in too. Having trained since an early age, they're instilled with a passion for self-expression through dance, and it's a tradition that's been maintained for many years. As soon as they pulled me onto that dance floor and taught me the martial art, I just gave in, let go, and spun like a Uyghur girl. In Pusanko, there are a lot of grapes grown each year, and the majority make the beautiful transition from grape to raisin. There are over a hundred different types of grapes in Terpan, and because of that, no two raisins are ever quite the same. In the Grape Valley, you'll see these mud structures everywhere. The Uyghur people used it to harvest their grapes and turn them into raisins. The little holes in the structure allow for air and sunlight to penetrate into the area where the grapes are and that allows the drying process to occur faster. I'm going to help this granddad here deliver some of these grapes into one of those rooms. Oh, <laughs> When the grapes are ready for harvest, they're taken to the drying room. At this time of year, things are especially hectic for the Uyghur families because their livelihood depends on these raisins. They work all hours till the job is done and always as a family unit without complaint. So the next time you pop the raisin into your mouth, think about where they came from. If it's from Turpan, it means a whole lot of good old hard work. And knowing that, you're bound to appreciate the natural sweetness of each bite that much more. She just told me that this frame here will hold 150 kilograms of grapes. And the entire room, 20 tons. So they hang all this here to dry, and they become raisins. Built in 1778, the Ermin Minaret is the largest minaret in Xinjiang. It was built under a commission by Suman, head of Turpan Prefecture and the second son of Ermin Koja, a famous Qing Dynasty general. Suman built a monument to honor the achievements of his father and serve as an expression of his loyalty to the Qing Dynasty. Designed by a Uyghur architect named Ibrahim, the tower exhibits the beauty and glory of Uyghur architecture. Ibrahim used sun-dried bricks in a diamond pattern, the same that are found in most Uyghur buildings, and incorporated a simple wooden pillar and dome sacred area into the adjoining mosque. The serenity of the tower is strangely addictive, and I can't help but continue to wander on in search of past secrets, exploring every nook and corner. As the sun continues to rise, I climb the tower in the hope of finding a magnificent view. And I'm not disappointed. Framed by dome-shaped windows are uninterrupted views of lush trees occupied by singing birds and village homes. A scene of perfect balance between nature and man.
Turpan is located in a depression approximately 80 meters below sea level. And let me tell you, its nickname, the oven, sure does it justice. With an average annual rainfall of less than 2 centimeters a year, Turpan relies heavily on its water irrigation system called the Karez. A Karez system consists of wells, underground channels, canals, and small reservoirs. The natural slope of the terrain is used to direct the water to the people while minimizing evaporation along the way. Dating back to the Han Dynasty, the irrigation system receives its water from the surrounding mountains and from the annual snow melt. There are just under a thousand caress systems in Turpan. The total length of canals is over 5,000 kilometers. Even the children know what a large part the caress plays in their lives. All this talk about water is making me thirsty. The Uyghur girls have offered me a drink, and the water is deliciously cool. For its ingenuity, the Karez system is counted as one of the three great projects of ancient China, along with the Great Wall and the Grand Canal. The water ensures the continuing survival of the people living in this oasis. Every day for 2,000 years, people here are reminded of past glories. Located 10 kilometers west of Turpan, in the Uranaisi Valley, lies the ancient city of Jiaohe. It's the oldest, the best preserved, and at 220,000 square meters, the largest earth-built city in the world. In its day, Jiaohe was the powerful capital of South Chesi, a kingdom at the time of the Han Dynasty that thrived under Uyghur rule. When Mongol rebels invaded the city at the end of the 8th century, the inhabitants were forced to flee, and eventually, the city was completely deserted. Over 2,000 years ago, these same walls here belong to a palace in the kingdom of Jushi. People here used to build their houses underground so as to be able to use the soil as their walls. Wow, these steps are killing me. But if I were walking down these same steps, right above me would be two stories and I would be in the basement. Talk about integrating nature with architecture. Brilliant. It's so serene being here. There's a cool breeze in the air. The sun's about to set. I wonder what it's been like for the same people living here watching that sunset over 2,000 years ago. You can almost hear the ladies preparing dinner, the children at play, and the husbands coming back to work. You know, at times like these, I really wish I could have seen it, and it would be great if somebody invented a time machine. On the first leg of our Xinjiang journey, I've been amazed by just how engaging and friendly the Uyghur people are. They've embraced our arrival and welcomed us into their lives with open arms, shown us their culture and given us the opportunity to share it. It really made me want to learn more about their lives and their great heritage, and I was given the opportunity at Jiaohe. According to historical records, it was once home to 700 households, 6,500 residents, and 865 soldiers. I can still see the outline of the city gates, military bases, and homes of this once magnificent city.
A very typical village in Turpan is associated with a not so typical history. Overshadowed by the fire mountain, Tuyiko was once the center of Buddhism, but in time, it became a predominantly Muslim community. In 1905, a German explorer came and settled here, attracted by its rich religious heritage. In fact, around the same time, Turpan was attracting many visitors curious about the culture and lives of the people here. Long ago, five visitors came from Arabia to Tiyiko in search of Allah. But during the journey, they were followed by villains. The five men fled and met a shepherd during their escape, who became the first Chinese Islamic convert. He took them to a cave to hide, but afraid that his dog might accidentally give their location away, he beat his dog. But still, it returned, even with all its legs broken. Moved by the dog's loyalty, they eventually let it stay. When they emerged, they realized that 300 years had passed. The locals were curious and went in search of the group, but while their cave was discovered, the group was never seen again. Today, in Tuyiko, the place where the seven holy beings were last sighted is one of the most important Muslim holy places in the East. I've been told that the Tuyiko tombs are listed as a holy place in the Quran. While there are a lot of foreigners that come here every year, it's especially important to the local Muslim community in Xinjiang. The locals here build their homes around the tombs and they feel honored to do so. These homes, they're 400 years old. Imagine living in a home passed down from your great, great, great grandparents more than 400 years back. Well, that's the Uyghur way. They continue to live in their ancestors' home in the traditional manner. You'll find furniture and utilities that date back years. I don't think half my furniture now would last that long. They really don't make things like they used to. Walking through the neighborhood, I feel as though I'm being transported back to a time and place where things were less complicated and unpretentious, and where neighbors really were, well, neighbors. But it's time to say goodbye to this peaceful village and journey to the west in search of the infamous Fire Mountain. This part of the Tianshan Mountain is called Fire Mountain, aptly named because the weather here is fiery hot, and at times, the mountain glows like a blazing flame. In the Chinese classic, Journey to the West, you'll remember Fire Mountain as the mountain the monk Xuanzang crossed on his journey to India in search of Buddhist scriptures. How difficult it must have been in the past for Xuanzang and later for generations of the local Uyghurs to scale this mountain. I've been asking around and apparently the Uyghur minority in Kuralar live differently than the ones in Turpan. So let's go see. Come on. From Turpan, we go by road to Korola. From Urumuchi, it's about 200 kilometers southwest by plane. Lying beside the Talamu, a very important river in Xinjiang, Korola is a combination of grassland, desert, and the Gobi. And what better way to see that than by plane? So we strap our cameraman on board and give him the task of showing you a bird's eye view of the Talamu River.
Few of the Lobu, a subgroup of the Uyghur ethnic group, still live in the nearby village. When the lake dried up, most moved on in search of greener pastures. You can also see the lower reaches of the now dry Lobu Lake from here. Most of the lake is now part of the Gobi Desert. Our cameraman really got to see how the natural landscape had changed over the years. Oh, it's hot. Look what I have though. It's a traditional all-weather Lobu hat. See, over winter, they put it over their head like this, so it covers their ears and, you know, helps them keep warm. But over summer, they lift it up, so it's a lot cooler. And if they're trying to block out the sun, whoop, there's even a solution to that. Now I'm going to find myself some sheep to tend to. Uh, probably not going to use that. That's more my thing. I'm a bit of a speed demon, so I think I managed to scare the owner of the four-wheeler I'm in. You should have heard a sigh of relief when I stepped on the brakes. Boston Lake is actually made up of two lakes, Big Boston Lake and its younger sibling. You guessed it, Small Boston Lake. The larger of the two is where most of the fishing is done, while the smaller is a place where you can make waves or just take a slow cruise, enjoying the natural landscape that passes you by. It's so hot out, I think I need some wind in my hair. I need to get on the speedboat and go for a ride. So, jump aboard and let's go. Come on, let's put some ripples in this water. Put my feet up, see you later. There's nothing like the feeling of being on board a speedboat crashing through the water. Slow down a little, you'll see the congregation of lotus flowers and families of ducks feeding in the calmer areas of the water. With the wind in my hair, this leg of the journey is both exciting and peaceful, a real treat for my senses. Been to the Gobi Desert, the Flaming Mountain, and now we're at the Lake Boston, surrounded by mangroves and mountains. The Uyghur community has been so inviting and warm, and it has been the most amazing journey. Well, I'm off for now, but I'll see you next week. And keep traveling with me, Michelle Lean, on Travelog.